the independent breatharian couple claimed they lived a food-free lifestyle and haven't felt hungry since 2008. The Sun, we lived on air. Breatharian couple claimed they have barely eaten for nine years and think they only need the universe's energy to live. And she even ditched food for her entire pregnancy. Holy crap, Breatharians. Folks that claim they only need to eat a few times a year. And that when they do, they're not doing it because they're hungry or because they need to eat. They're just doing it for social reasons, to be polite. In those moments, if I choose to drink something or eat something, it's not ever because I feel hungry. I don't remember what that sensation feels like. So loads of people sent me this on Twitter. Folks that claim that they don't even remember what hunger is like anymore. They just don't feel the need to eat, even during their pregnancy. Almost, I think, maybe four times in my pregnancy with him, I ate something. And this was like in, in social settings. Hell, you even get people who claim that they've been blessed by the gods such that they didn't have to eat for decades. Pralad Yani, an Indian holy man born in 1929, claims to have neither eaten nor drank since childhood. Yani described how three goddesses appeared to him and told him that he, quote, need not be concerned about food ever again. It was another study conducted in India in 2003 that bafflingly seems to confirm the phenomenon of pranic feeding. It was conducted on a yogi who claims he has neither eaten nor drank for decades. Not quite sure why that would be a blessing, because pizza is delicious. But apparently they did all sorts of scientific tests, but amazingly confirmed part of what the guy was claiming. I mean, all possible things that could be done non-invasively in this hi-fi corporate hospital with the help of so much. Most of us are trained abroad also, and we were just scratching our head as to, as to this, the greatest surprise that we saw in our lifetime so far. Yeah, right. Look, this is one of the dumbest and simplest to debunk pieces of bullshit ever. And I'm not talking about in hours by some great supervised test, but in minutes, hell, maybe even in seconds, by just saying, here, breathe in to this. But look, this isn't just some odd isolated nut. There are all sorts of breatharians out there who claim that they only need water to live on. Because there's been so much interest lately, is how do I become a breatharian? What do I do? Well, this is probably one of the going to be your greatest assets or saviors is when you're hungry and you don't want to be eating, but you, you know that you've got bacteria, parasites, yeast, molds, molds, flukes, and perhaps even tapeworms. And you we didn't have one drop of water for eight days complete, and then we started drop by drop adding water, and then we never ate again. Would you like to be free from the daily dependency on food? Can you imagine being in a world where you're not really hungry and you're not really thirsty and most of the energy comes from breathing or from energetic nourishment. Okay, can you hear me out there? Yes. So what, what did I do? Well, three months ago I ran, or two, I can't remember, two months ago, I can't remember how long it was. I ran a marathon for not eating for nearly three months. 21 kilometers, finished it, didn't feel thirsty, didn't feel so hungry either. Your energetic centers will be aligned. It means that your energetic uh, inner circle will be much wider than the regular one. I've eaten four times for the last five months. What happens in our body is that when we eat, we also bring in toxins. And these toxins accumulate with time and that brings up disease. But when you're a breatharian, when you eat so little, the body always has the time to clean itself. This is the kitchen of a breatharian. For 63 days, this woman has, she claims, gone without any food whatsoever, apart from fish stock tea with a dash of cider vinegar. However, for some reason, they need a food processor, a blender, and a coffee machine in their kitchen. Breatharians, who claim to have been blessed by the gods, who the Indian army actually did research on. You know, because if their soldiers in their army and their potential astronauts didn't need food, then that would be a fantastic discovery. 
uh, what I'd like to share with your readers, your viewers, is that there's so much scientific experimentation being done on this already. Hopes that their research, which will be published in a few months, and I can't wait, like scientific Kijong exploration, which has been put together by one of the heads of the Chinese scientific community. Will help soldiers survive without food or drink, or assist astronauts during their long stays in space. How many times are these agencies going to keep trying over and over again to find such miracles? Or, you know, just your comedy garden breatharians who for some unexplained reason need a fridge full of food. So he has fruit juice and he has tofu and vegan food and soya milk when we have guests for tea. Yeah. Now, no one would bother much with this nonsense if it wasn't for the fact that Jasmine's teachings are linked to the deaths of a Melbourne housewife, Lani Morris, and Timo Deegan, a German school teacher. And this woman who wrote the book about how she could live on only light. Well, we're joined now from Brisbane by Jasmine Heen, who is uh, the uh, author of uh, Living on Light. And, and uh, how long did you go without eating? Well, pretty well just on water and tea for two years. Uh, and did you lose weight? No, because I treat the body as a biocomputer, the mind as a software program, and you can reprogram the body if you have a strong mind-body connection. How many supporters? Mm, probably 100 million. 100? 100. 100 million. You're doing well. <laughs> we are. A, a professor, Lu Zinyung, and he talks about the state of bijou that people go into where they're living normal lives and they're not eating. Okay, where, where? Very rare. When she was actually put under 24-hour surveillance to make sure that she wasn't actually eating or drinking anything, lost six kilos in four days. Right? How much water have you had? None. None whatsoever? No, I'm not how, allowed. How much food? None, I'm not allowed. How are you feeling? I feel really good now. Yeah, well, I'd look like I'd lost a lot of weight, and the doctor confirmed saying, yeah, yeah. You're not looking real well. No, I feel good. And then four days of absolute fasting. During this time, our immune system is becoming much stronger, and I will explain much more during the process itself, because it's completely scientific. And her pulse is about double what it was when she started. Is she entering a dangerous period? Very much so. If my body you, tells me, yes. That you can't survive on air. No, that's not true because I've done it for a long period of time and the last time, look, 6,000 people have done this around the world without any problem, Richard. But look, even to a layman like me, at the end of four days, I can see your body's collapsing. Hmm, odd how that works, isn't it? Nah, really, it's the air, it's intelligent and you're just tapping into that energy. So through the breath, that I'm consciously breathing, I tap into the air. And the air is intelligence, is information, is life force, is chi, is prana. Practitioners of this bizarre ideology, known as breatharians, claim that humans can instead be sustained by the cosmic energy of prana, the Sanskrit word for life force. So when you are a truly conscious breatharian, you are a person, a being that uses the breath to connect with intelligence within the air. Look, I've got a more fact-based appraisal of the situation for you. You need oxygen from the air. That's why you have lungs in the first place. And when you breathe out, you breathe out carbon dioxide from your lungs. This is why you have lungs in the first place. Look, what your metabolism is effectively doing is it's taking oxygen. That's the stuff you get from the air through your lungs. And then you absorb that into your body and you use it to burn sugar, which gives carbon dioxide, which of course you breathe out through your lungs, water and energy. Your body is essentially doing the opposite of photosynthesis. And it's using that energy to allow your body to move, for your heart to pump blood, for the electrochemistry of your brain to think and so forth. And you're not exactly unique in this either. Basically every other organism on earth that consumes oxygen does the same. Now, nah, let me guess, they've just acquired eating food as a habit too. Now here is Mr. Wiley Brooks, who stopped eating 17 years ago, claiming that all the elements we need to survive are in the air and an occasional glass of fruit juice. Uh, this is called breatharianism. 
as it becomes a habit. In other words, eating is an acquired habit, just like drinking alcohol or smoking cigarettes. Mm -hmm. And you know how much oxygen you actually need per day? It's about a kilo, about two pounds, the same weight as a one liter bottle of soda, which you use to burn about a kilo of food, which is essentially sugar. You know, carbohydrates, that sort of thing. And then you breathe out about 1.4 kilos of carbon dioxide per day, and you produce about half a liter of water. This is why when NASA decided they were going to send men to the moon, you know, where they would be on their own for a, about a week or so, they had to put enough oxygen in the capsule for them to survive and carbon dioxide scrubbers, because without them, the carbon dioxide would have simply built up in a confined system and would kill you. Because if you're going to survive in an oversized Coke can for about a week, you need to know how much oxygen to take with you. Yeah, running out of oxygen when you're about half a million kilometers, quarter of a million miles or so away from the nearest oxygen source would be bad. So yeah, you go through the sums and it turns out you breathe out about one gram of carbon dioxide per minute. It's actually quite a lot of mass. It's about the mass of three aspirin tablets of carbon dioxide per minute. Okay, so here I have three aspirin tablets, which all together, We're just about a gram. So that's how much carbon dioxide, how much mass of carbon dioxide you breathe out in just one minute. And the bare minimum is the carbon in that carbon dioxide molecule came from your body. Sorry, if you're breathing out carbon dioxide, your body is literally burning away with every single breath you take. And oddly, the nutritionists and other scientists they had doing tests on these people who claimed that they didn't have to eat curiously missed this one. To prove that he's not taking anything, he's not taking food, not taking uh, water, not passing urine and not passing stool. This had to be proved only physically. You have to keep a watch on him and it could be proved. And it was a camera observation. I started my mind that he is, uh, he is cheating and this is not going to continue. From day one only, I took all possible measures to see that he is not left alone for a moment. Sorry, if you're breathing out carbon dioxide, this party's over. It ain't pranic energy or some other bullshit. I am nourished by prana, as, as the old um, Eastern religion did believe that there is a prana in the air or chi energy or something like that. Where are they getting their sustenance from if they're not getting it from food? I know that I am uh, nourished. And I am nourished probably very, very well, much better than I was nourishing myself. Chi, the chi, the universal life force, or what we call prana, or if you're a religious person, you would say you are fed by the light of God, and obviously that's very hard to measure. You're metabolizing sugar using oxygen, which your lungs got from the air to make carbon dioxide and water, just like the rest of us. Hell, this isn't even remotely controversial. Look, if I breathe into a bag and I put a carbon dioxide meter in there. Okay, so what you've got here is a carbon dioxide meter and an oxygen meter. Now these are actually for school demos, this sort of stuff. But it turns out you actually use, um, yeah, these, these sorts of things are very commonly used for automotive, you know, for diagnosing engines, because the oxygen content that comes in and out of your engine is exactly the same as the stuff you breathe, and the carbon dioxide you breathe out is exactly the same as the stuff that comes out of a car engine. So anyway, you can see that the oxygen's cruising at about 21%, um, and the carbon dioxide's still a bit high because I just breathed on the meter. So, uh, but this will usually about about three, 400 parts per million, uh, which is 0.03% or something. So here I have a bag of my exhaled breath. So first of all, I'm gonna start this running. And then I'm gonna stick my carbon dioxide meter in first. Like that. And then my oxygen meter in second. 
so that you should have both the meters in my exhale breath. And what you'll find is the oxygen meter responds much more quicker than the carbon dioxide meter. It's a pretty slow responding carbon dioxide meter, this one. But you see that the oxygens immediately drop down from about 21% to about 15%. So my my when I breathe in, I breathe in about 20% oxygen, and when I breathe out, it's only about 15% oxygen. And it'll take a little while for the carbon dioxide to sort itself out. Okay, so there you go, the oxygen's down about 5% and the carbon dioxide's are up about 5% from what I breathed in. So that's just how quickly you can debunk all this breatharian crap. It's just saying, breathe into this bag. You know, let me just measure your oxygen and your carbon dioxide. Yeah, that carbon dioxide that I'm breathing out there used to be part of my body, either as fat or proteins or sugar or something, whatever, the carbon in that carbon dioxide came from my body. And now that I've breathed it out, of course, my body is lighter. There, you see, you don't have to watch someone starve themselves for about a week. All you have to do is say, breathe into this bag. Although I've got to admit, I too would have taken a certain eh, satisfaction in watching one of these breatharians actually eat and drink nothing for a a week or so, especially seeing some of the folks that preach this to and have taken it seriously ended up dead. I, I don't mean to belittle your, your beliefs, and I'm sure they're sincerely held, but there is a woman who is dead in Scotland as a consequence of following your well, principles. We well, we don't need to leave it because we know that the diary that she left behind that was found with her body makes extensive references to your book and your ideas. She starved and, herself to and death. You, so, further, the air that you breathe out doesn't just contain carbon dioxide, but it's also got quite a lot of humidity, and it's quite warm. The bottom line is, the air that you breathe out is about 5% water too, but that's done by volume. And seeing as carbon dioxide vapor is almost twice as dense as water vapor, turns out that there's almost twice as much carbon dioxide there as there is water. So let's say you breathe a fairly normal 8 liters of air per minute. That's about 500 liters per hour. That means that the entire weight going through your lungs every hour is about half a kilogram. Now of that, you absorb about 35 grams of oxygen. And just so we keep this all in perspective, a chocolate bar weighs about 50 grams. So in an hour, you absorb almost a chocolate bar's weight worth of oxygen from the air. But you excrete about 50 grams of carbon dioxide and a further 20 grams of water. Ah, but as some of you might quite rightly point out, that's not actual weight loss. That's not weight that I'm completely losing because a lot of the oxygen, both in the carbon dioxide that I breathe out and the water that I breathe out, also came from the air that I breathed in. So long story short, turns out that just about half of that mass is actual weight loss per hour. And my body is burning away. So a few years ago, I actually did this really neat demo just to show how much energy your body releases in a day by burning about the right amount of sugar that your body burns in a day. And I did it with an oxidant, but the amount of energy released is about the same, and the amount of gas released is about the same as the amount of gas that your body releases in a day. And my body is burning away. And if my body is burning away, you can put as much water into it as you want. The bottom line is, if you don't put any extra carbon material into it, that would be food, you know, sort of sugars or proteins or fats. Sorry, you're just going to burn away till there's nothing left. And then you die. We usually call this starvation. This is simple conservation of energy and conservation of mass.
And if you really believe that you can power your body by spiritual energy, your chakras will be open. And once your chakras are open, you're actually being nourished from prana, which is an amazing experience. Not merely a philosophical concept, prana is said to be a physical substance, much like radioactive or electromagnetic waves. The sun is referred to as one of the main sources of this vital, life-sustaining energy. It's exactly what man has done. The body was created perfect. It needed nothing but the breath of life which comes from our, the creative source, God or universal intelligence or whatever name you want to put on it. And Wiley Brooks preached much the same message as Jasmine and built quite a following until he was caught coming out of a fast food store with a chicken pie. He was seen coming out of a 7-Eleven McDonald's because he was traveling with a group of people who eat. I mean, would you like me to say, hey, Richard, we're traveling together, don't you eat? It's not really cool. <laughs> so he was coming, came out with a chicken pie, but he wasn't going to eat it himself. That is the press. And that is a breath barrier. As we tap in this intelligence, we tap in the intelligence of the energy of creation. The energy that creates everything and every being, every galaxy, every constellation. Fine. Let's see you run a power plant of that spiritual energy. So it turns out you can measure the actual weight your body loses in about an hour. So I actually got these really accurate skills to try this myself. So you'll recall that the calculations say that you should be about 35 grams lighter at the end of an hour just from your breathing. So I got a balance that can weigh within 10 grams. So in principle, you should be able to measure your weight loss in just over 20 minutes. So I weigh myself every 20 minutes or so without going to the bathroom, without eating or drinking anything. And between about 10 and 11.30 in the morning, I lose about 150 grams. And then I go and have something to eat over lunch. And I do the same thing again in the afternoon. And again, I lose about 100 grams per hour. And then I repeat it for about 20 days. And for those 20 days, I was actually on a diet, which is why over progressive days, the actual values are getting lower and lower. And on the right there, you can even see one or two times when I went to the bathroom during the test, because <laughs> sometimes the flesh is weak. But anyway, it doesn't matter. The point is you can trivially measure your weight loss over a period of an hour, and it's remarkably constant. Now, for me, it was just over 100 grams per hour, which turns out to be freakishly high, because most of my normal colleagues lost about half of that. So I've put us all starting from the same point here. So you're looking at weight loss per hour. And this was measured over the period of an afternoon. So in brown, you've got a 30 year old 80 kilogram male. Then below that, you've got a 25 year old 80 kilogram male. Then in purple, you've got a 65 kilogram 35 year old female. In yellow is a 35 year old 90 kilogram male. Brown is a 75 kilo 25 year old man. And then in blue, that's me there. That's a 90 kilogram, 45 year old male. So for this very small sample, there really wasn't that much of a pattern in here in terms of age or weight. So some of that's water and some of it's carbon dioxide. In fact, hell, let's take our breatharian who didn't need food or water. She lost six kilograms in four days. By day four, her condition had deteriorated dramatically. Her pulse rate was up, blood pressure down, and she had lost six kilos. Which is six kilograms every hundred hours. Or about 60 grams per hour. Almost exactly what everyone else loses. Because she, just like everyone else, needs to keep warm. And that energy is generated by burning stuff with oxygen in your body. And that's what powers your heart and allows it to beat. It's what allows your lungs to move and your body to move. And because of that, you also need to breathe out carbon dioxide. I mean, let me just give you an example. As I mentioned earlier, I've been dieting recently, essentially trying to burn off some of my body fat. Now in a day, you can either burn about one kilogram of sugar or about half a kilogram of fat. So to lose 100 grams per day, which I've been doing for about a month now, is actually a really steep diet. And most of that weight, of course, is coming out through my mouth as carbon dioxide. But of course, during that time, I'm keeping my water levels about constant. So let's take the uh, breatharian diet. You know, the one where you're just living off the 
chi in the air. Well, that was losing six kilograms in four days. This is what a no water and no food diet looks like. Now, it's also interesting that a large portion of my colleagues, not least of all myself, seem to lose a great deal more than the 35 grams per hour, which you get as a prediction from breathing about eight liters of air per minute. Now, I think that a large part of this is when you sleep, your metabolism drops way down. In fact, you can sort of do a fairly easy test like this, that when I go to bed, I weigh myself, and when I wake up about eight hours later, I weigh myself again, and it turns out that I lose about 300 grams overnight, which is about 35 grams per hour. So it looks like when I'm asleep, my metabolism is cut by a third or so compared to when I'm awake. However, I then went and got on an exercise bike, and there I watched the weight loss that I was doing per hour shoot up to a whopping 800 grams per hour. Although probably at this point, about three quarters of that weight loss is water. So how did I get an estimate of that, I hear you ask? Well, I measured the oxygen and carbon dioxide content of my breath at rest. And then again, while doing exercise. And it's really almost exactly the same in both cases. You know, maybe... 10, 20% difference, that sort of thing, but mostly the same. So all I have to do is measure the difference in my rate of breathing when I'm at rest and when I'm on the exercise bike. And so the easiest way of doing this is you just get a 60 liter garbage bag. Well, it doesn't really matter what size garbage bag it is. And you just fill it up with your breath when you're resting. And then of course you get on the exercise bike and see how many of the same size garbage bags you fill up in the same period of time. And for me, it was about three to four. So my metabolism is running about three to four times faster when I'm doing this sort of exercise than when I'm at rest. So it's kind of interesting that, you know, I have my baseline metabolism here. And when I go to sleep, it cuts down by about a third. And when I'm doing exercise, it ramps up by a factor of three. So yeah, I think the reason that most of my colleagues appear to have, mm, above normal weight loss per hour, averaged over 24 hours, is essentially because they spend about a third of their time asleep, and therefore their waking metabolism must be somewhat higher to compensate for that. But I digress. The point is, if you're breathing out carbon dioxide, all the prana, all the chi, all the light of God in the entire world won't help you beat the thermodynamics, or the fact that every minute you spend breathing you're getting about one gram lighter. Or every hour you spend breathing, you're getting about a chocolate bar lighter. Or every day you spend breathing, you're getting about a kilogram lighter. And if you don't do anything about it, you're gonna be about a week from proving that the only thing breatharianism is good for is starving yourself to death. And honestly, if you still believe in this stuff, just ask your breatharian masters or breatharian gurus or whoever claims this stuff just to breathe into a bag and get it tested for carbon dioxide or just get themselves to weigh themselves on an accurate balance over the period of just one hour. And then we will see if they really can beat the laws of thermodynamics. And if you like cool, scientifically literate media like this, and believe me, there is such a need for scientifically literate media out there, and you want to support this stuff, you can support this channel directly through Patreon.